Good evening and welcome to the seventh in our series of webinars. Um, for those of you that can't remember, I'm William Stockdale, Chair of Thornsley Street History Group. Uh, this evening's presentation is by Al Oswald from the University of York. Al's topic is, what can the discoveries made at Warren Percy teach us about medieval Thornsley Street and the potential for future investigations here? Now, if you do have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, if you become aware of any sort of technical problem that we're not aware of, well, then you could use chat. Uh, but other than that, questions into the Q&A box, please. I'll now hand you over to Al. Thank you very much indeed, William. Right, we now have the slightly tense moment where I take the reins. And I hope that is now working. Well, yes, thanks again and good evening to everyone. Um, I thought I'd start with probably the most important lesson that we can learn from Warham, which is that uh, participation in a research project like this can be an extraordinarily bonding experience and create a community that will uh, survive for decades. So um, good luck to you in that. I noticed that William has already married one of his fellow members of the group. So that's, you've got off to a roaring start there. That's great. But um, much more seriously, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Stuart Ruffmill, who I think spoke to you a few weeks ago, uh, made the point that research has to continue, particularly with deserted medieval villages, because in a sense, they've been deserted once. And Stuart uh, rather elegantly made the observation that the moment research stops, um, that we've effectively deserted that site again, and rather more unfairly than the first time round. So I think you're very um, wise to be looking to your to future plans for investigating the village, and I'm sure that is the the right thing to do. Um, so what can we learn from, from the experience at Warham? Well, uh, before that, I thought I ought to say a little bit about my background for those of you who uh, haven't encountered me before. Um, so until a decade ago, I was uh, in charge of English Heritage's then, which is now Historic England's uh, landscape investigation team for the North of England. And I worked on that with uh, Stuart Ainsworth uh, on the left here, who will be familiar to many of you from Time Team. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, critics of uh, Historic England, English Heritage as then was, were apt to caption this photograph, English Heritage experts fail to find castle. But there is actually a, a very serious point here, which is that um, when we're trying to understand uh, the details of something, we also have to step back and look at the bigger picture in order to put it that detail into uh, some kind of context. So that's very much my specialism is, is standing back and trying to take a big picture overview. But in doing so, you necessarily have to scrutinise all the minor details to get to that big picture. So um, I think that my background will lead me to uh, think about non-invasive non techniques, in other, in other words, not necessarily about excavation as the first line of attack. But I hope it will also allow you to think very carefully about where you do target excavation if you proceed in that direction. So, um, moving back to Warham, the original question uh, posed by Morris Beresford in particular, the, the medieval economic historian was what was everyday life like for medieval peasants and that is uh, very much the same question you uh, asked about Thornton the Street and uh, going back to what Stuart Rathnell said I'm also very grateful to the Thornton the Street group for actually forcing me to think about a different angle this sort of compare and contrast exercise between Warham and Thornton I think it is potentially quite useful. Um, I must say I've been giving more or less the same talk on Warham for 10 years, but for tonight I've, I've actually revised my thinking and started to think about things afresh. 
So in keeping with what Stuart Rathmel advised us to do, I feel I'm, that the, uh, the group's invitation has helped me um, keep Warham alive a bit longer. And although that was the original research question at Warham, um, with the publication of the apparently final synthesis of the, of the investigations at Warham in, in 2013, the, the question rather switched to thinking about, actually, with hindsight, how representative are the findings at Warham? How can we use it really as a benchmark for looking at other deserted medieval villages around the country? And the conclusion has to be, well, not entirely, that in many respects, Warham is not your average or typical deserted medieval village. So I think we need to bear that in mind when we're using it as a yardstick for what to do next at Thornton the Street. One significant point of departure is that the earthwork remains at Warham are extremely clear and for those of you who haven't been there that's usually a, a, about 40% a of the audience at these talks I find um, for those of you who haven't been there, now is a very good time to go and see it. Don't go there in high summer when the grass is knee high. Go there now uh, when it's bitterly cold and the light is low and you'll only have a few hours to scuttle around as fast as you can. But you will be able to decipher more about the earthworks if you go there now than if you go in high summer. And the point is that uh, at Thornton Street, the earthworks are really pretty unclear in some respects, particularly those relating to the houses. So if we compare this house at Warham, which uh, those of you who, this is a rather low res photograph, it was taken on a camera, a traditional camera very long ago, which I think had a file size of about 300 kilobytes or something was the, was the output. But even that on this, you can see that you can see the, not only the outline of the house, but you can see the internal divisions so you can see that it's got three rooms and if you look carefully you can see the door openings on either side the opposed doorways so the irony is that if you'd had that clarity of earthwork survival at Thornton the street I wouldn't now be sitting here talking to you because I think um, it was really only uh, Jim's uncertainty about exactly where to put the relatively small trench that you had permission to dig uh, in the context of a site where the earthwork remains were not that clear and the house outlines and uh, were virtually indistinguishable. Um, it was only that because of that, those circumstances that Jim gave me a ring and said, can you come and have a look at this and give us some advice? So um, if we did have these immaculate outlines of houses that so uh, attracted Maurice Beresford in the first place to Warren Percy, uh, I wouldn't be involved at Thornton Street and who knows your research might be taking a very different direction by now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so because of the clarity of that earthwork survival um, it has attracted earlier surveys and this was the earliest survey of all by Lieutenant Rottersley in 1853 and I must say he didn't he didn't do badly at all he you've been fairly well served by um, the Ordnance Survey in that respect so you've got a, a pretty decent um, record of, of the earthworks there including one or two that are not so clear now on the surface but that was a lieutenant if you employ a captain you get a much better quality of, of mapping evidently. Actually that's a bit unfair, I'm, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, but Captain Bailey clearly had a, a pretty serious personal interest in understanding archaeological earthworks and consequently he did an extremely job, a good job, uh, not just here but at all the other sites where he worked uh, in North Yorkshire and beyond. And um, in fact he went on to become the head of boundaries within the Ordnance Survey, which is a, a really uh, powerful position in the Ordnance Survey hierarchy. And that must be an indication of the quality of his work. <clears throat>
So at Warham here, the record he made of the humps and bumps, including many that have now been ploughed flat uh, with the encroachment of modern arable agriculture around the fringes of the site. Um, this record was um, and remains absolutely fantastic. In fact, uh, Captain Bailey recorded a number of earthworks which weren't recorded again uh, so perceptively until uh, the English Heritage Survey that I carried out in 2003 with colleagues. So uh, again, because of the survival of these earthworks, the Ordnance Survey has been back to it on multiple occasions and you can see how the parameters of their survey work changed. Uh, here, for example, the houses are uh, visible, but many of the property boundaries are not. So clearly the, the criteria they used for what needed to be mapped had changed and we don't have the records for that any longer. Um, but the survey that was made during the Warren Percy research project, as you can see, uh, was carried out sort of piecemeal in, in little bursts over the course of 25 years, uh, mostly by Dickie Porter. And a lot of it was done while the excavations were in progress, which was during the summer months, which, as I've already said, are not the ideal time to be looking at the humps and bumps up there. Um, and here I think we can learn something from Warren Percy, because although there was certainly a very productive dialogue between the um, excavators or the results of the excavations and the earthwork survey that was in progress in tandem, um, and that, that dialogue has much to be said for it. I think it also has um, drawbacks in that questions which could have been answered quite straightforwardly through earthwork survey in the early stages uh, were not addressed until quite late on. And also uh, questions which couldn't have been answered through earthwork survey uh, and really necessitated thorough and detailed excavation uh, remain to be addressed even today. So I don't think we've necessarily reached the end of the line with research at Warren Percy, but that remains to be seen. Um, another lesson we can learn about the Earthwork Survey, I think, is that there's a temptation to think that it's all about uh, the accuracy of the survey and, and the quality of the technology available to us. And we are extremely lucky in having this quality of, of data. So I'm sure most of you will by now, by now know what LIDAR is, but it is essentially uh, a scan of the ground surface um, taken from either a drone or a light air aircraft, a light aircraft in this case, this has been gathered by uh, the Environment Agency uh, for flood modeling purposes. Um, but, uh, we can use an algorithm if we want to, to strip off the trees and buildings and just examine the, the earthworks in isolation, naked as it were. And with this level of technology at our disposal, I think it's very tempting to think, well, you know, why do we need to do traditional earthwork survey? It's really, uh, it's really a thing of the past. Um, and in a sense, I'd have to agree with that. It is, it is a sort of anachronism. And yet, I think the point is that there is a temptation to think that because we have an accurate survey, we've done everything that can be done. And I don't think that's the case. So uh, this survey, which I carried out nearly 20 years ago now, in many respects is no different from the one carried out uh, by the Ordnance Survey in 1853 or indeed the one, the much more detailed survey carried out uh, by Dickie Porter and friends during the course of the Warren research project. But the significant difference is that um, we approached it in a very different way. So we were actually looking for uh, evidence for stratigraphic relationships for change through time from the outset. And that was really something that um, even though the excavations at Warren Percy made it clear quite quickly that there, there, there was a, 
uh, a very deeply layered um, landscape here um, with features from the Iron Age onwards. Um, that never really translated into the approach that was taken to the survey, looking for evidence for change through time and evidence for stratigraphic relationships. Um, and also I think that looking for change in the plan form, so not just the stratigraphic relationships, but actually looking at the plan and, think, and trying to dissect it in much the same way that a, a town planner would today, looking for different blocks, different characters of settlement within this area. That is another change that um, had grown on us in between the completion of the, the earthwork survey in the course of the Warren Research Project and my own uh, involvement. And I would say, pe people often say, well, obviously you had much higher technology, didn't you? And that's true to a degree, although we didn't have LIDAR uh, at the time. But it's not about the technology, and that's the message I want to get across. It's more about your mindset. It's more about what you're trying to, to uh, do with the survey, whether you're just trying to record objectively what's on the surface or whether you're approaching it uh, as an interrogation of the earthworks to try and get at uh, information and wring out as much uh, information as you can th through survey techniques. So um, the other thing I think that has changed is that uh, whereas the Warren Research Project was to begin with at least very focused on the medieval uh, occupation there, we can learn from that and understand that actually the landscape evolves through time and I think you've taken very much the right uh, course of action in starting to look from the word go about how the Roman road, for instance, influenced the, the development of the, the medieval village. Um, looking for that dynamic through time, I think will stand you in very good stead. In fact, I think we've already seen that because this is, uh, this is the plan or an extract from the plan that I made. Um, the north row of the village seems to be a relatively late introduction into the overall plan of the village at Warham. And it seems to have been laid out, the crofts and tofts here, such as they are, they're not uh, super clear, but they are there nonetheless. But the tofts and crofts here have been laid out over uh, the remains of er an earlier field pattern. And that I think is exactly what we saw in uh, the area that we surveyed um, as a group on the north side of Thornton Le Street, uh, when was it? Two years ago now, um, where in fact it looked as though those properties had been laid out over fields and then gone back to pastoral fields after the desertion of the village. So um, we are already starting to see that dynamic emerging even through the relatively small area of the land that we've surveyed already at Thornton Le Street. So I think there's more potential for looking at the wider area. I think it would be a mistake, I would say this wouldn't I, but I think it would be a mistake to stop with the earthwork at the point we've, uh, with the earthwork survey at the point we've left it so far. Uh, we've done a, an excellent job so far, I think, but we still don't have that overview uh, as far as we can. There are lots more earthworks surviving there, which might, I think, uh, inform our views of the bit we've already done and change our views of the bit we've already done. And I think it'd be a good idea to get all that uh, preliminary earthwork survey out of the way and milk it as far as we can before you think about moving on to uh, further excavation. Now this is, um, again, another point that I, it was only when uh, William suggested uh, a topic of comparing Warham and, uh, and Thornton and Street that I started to make a number of links between the two sites. And one of them is about the link with the, with the Roman road. So Thornton and Street uh, obviously has, appears to have sprung up around uh, 
a key point on a Roman road. At Warham, that wasn't at all clear at the start of the project, and it's only it was only really with uh, the involvement of uh, two of my colleagues in English heritage, Paul Everson and Dave Stocker, um, in the final synthesis of the Warham investigations, that the issue of the road, uh, the ancient road that runs through Warham, uh, assumed greater prominence because the name Warham had always been assumed or always known to mean, uh, whether it's in Old English or Old Norse, it means something about at the bends. So it was always uh, suspected that that related to the bends in the valley, which Warham mostly overlooks, um, which sounds quite plausible until you look at the valley and realize that there aren't very many bends at that particular point in the valley and that other bends elsewhere along the valley are just as bendy. Um, so what, is, what are the bends in question then? And I uh, reconstructed this uh, trackway, which we know has late Iron Age or possibly even earlier origins, uh, and re reconstructed its course through the village. You can see it in the foreground very clearly hit in this photograph as a hollow way. And if you look in the, the pasture field beyond the Hawthorns, um, where you can see the humps and bumps of the, the main part of the village, you can perhaps see that the, the same trackway carries on heading for the hedge line, uh, there again visible as a hollow way. But between those points, what did the trackway do? Well, it did a, a massive um, switchback, basically, to it's here making its way down a relatively gentle incline, natural incline, created by a side valley, and it then climbs back up the opposite side of the valley obliquely, creating this huge switchback, which um, Paul Everson and Dave Stocker suggested were the, the real bends in question. But actually, when uh, Warham came into existence in the late Saxon period, that this was, as the name Wolds implies, sort of undifferentiated rough grassland and people were really looking for any sort of landmarks they could find in this rather rather bleak landscape, bleak, bleak pastoral landscape. And these bends in this ancient road which had existed since at least the first century BC were one of the prominent landmarks. So they suggested actually that the, the bends in question are to do with the road, not to do with the natural topography. And I think that's quite interesting in that when we come to think about Thorntonley Street, what is it that leads Thorntonley Street to spring up at this particular spot on the road as opposed to any other spot? So I think there's some thinking there to be done about um, why here at, at Thorntonley Street? Is it something to do with the crossing of the Beck, for example? I'm just plucking that from thin air. There may be other factors, and there almost certainly are other factors, but I don't think we've thoroughly thought that through yet. Um, the uh, other point I'd like to make is about excavation. So uh, when Maurice Beresford first arrived at Warren Percy, uh, he was by his own admission not an archaeologist at all, he was a historian, and what he knew of excavation was pretty limited, and until he was joined by Dr John Hurst, the excavations were uh, quite frankly um, rather sort of more comparable to the antiquarian excavations of the 19th and early 20th centuries than to modern excavations like the one that you conducted uh, with Jim. But um, I think there is a, a lesson to be learned there in that the early trenches dug by Morris Beresford and, and, uh, and friends and other volunteers um, were all relatively small scale, some of them actually a little bit bigger than the, the one that you dug at Thorntonley Street, but several of them quite a lot smaller. Um, and in a way, these didn't sort out issues as Morris Beresford had hoped. In fact, it made things rather more complicated and he ended up digging lots and lots of little holes here and there 
uh, trying to sort things out and ultimately really just confusing himself more and more. Um, this slide in particular shows the point at which uh, Maurice Beresford, having been chasing the wall of a medieval house, came across a wall running perpendicular to the house um, and clearly of earlier date running underneath the house and at that point he sort of had to abandon his idea that what he was going to be encountering was a snapshot of the moment of desertion and what he was what he was confronted with was actually a, uh, a very complex evolving landscape. So the solution found at, at Warham was to move away from these relatively small trenches to opening up much larger areas where um, rather than actually adding complication to the issue the the trenches were able to sort out everything within a particular area and and reach some relatively satisfactory conclusions um, and i think that's where i'd i'd have to say that you need to be cautious in your in your uh, progress towards excavating because you could go on digging small holes like the, the excavation that you uh, undertook two years ago around the village for years to come and actually end up in the same position that Morris Beresford did of bit having some rather confusing results that don't tally between different trenches across wide areas. That said, the option of moving to large open area excavations I think is um, something which must be or should be a bit daunting for any local group. It demands significant resources in terms of time and money and uh, expertise and without wanting to put you off excavation altogether I think that may be beyond the group's uh, capabilities frankly. Um, it is a serious undertaking so my solution to that issue is not to say, right, don't dig all together, but that we need to think very carefully about targeting excavations in the future and uh, using non-invasive techniques to actually think about where we're going to put the small trenches that are within your capacity as a, uh, as a local group. Moving on, I just wanted to show you um, uh, talk about another aspect of the survey which is that uh, in this southern part of the village at Warham one of the most obvious houses is this one here and uh, this was the one that I showed you in the previous slide where Morris Beresford was was excavating the small trench across it. Um, now Beresford targeted that because it was the most obvious and I mentioned the, the wall underneath the house that he was rather puzzled and stumped by. And actually, in terms of uh, the earthwork survey, we can see relatively clearly, because that's quite visible on the surface, there's the wall that Morris Beresford excavated, but surviving as an earthwork. So its presence could have been anticipated. We can also identify a series of toft boundaries, or toft-ish boundaries, I would say. And under, underlying the house that Beresford first targeted, we can also see the remains of an earlier house which probably sat within one of those tofts rather than uh, spanning the boundaries of two different properties and jutting into the, the front street as the house that he uh, chose to excavate does. So um, where am I going with this? Well, I think the point here is that the reason that house was so obvious as an earthwork was because it was probably um, one of the last houses to be built in the village, possibly in the, in the mid 14th century. And it was probably one of the longest lasting, or one of the latest survivals in the village as well. Now, in the case of Thornton Street, we have a slightly different scenario where the houses that still stand in the village are probably the ones which uh, survived after the rest of the medieval village had shrunk away. So I'm not talking in particular about the 
the actual buildings that are there now, but they probably occupy the sites of medieval and post-medieval buildings, which were the continuation of the medieval village. So I think there is scope for actually taking your, I know uh, excavations were carried out in uh, William's garden, but there is probably further scope for looking at the gardens of other houses within the village and seeing if uh, it's those properties where the late medieval and post medieval activity continued. Uh, another point of comparison, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a proper throg, th frog in my throg in my throat, frog in my throat. Um, the other point of comparison I wanted to raise is the, the question of this um, two manners. So at Warren Percy for many years it was thought that there were two competing manors, one owned by the Chain Chamberlain family, the other by the Percy family. And it was generally thought that the, the North Manor, which is on the uh, sort of right of the, it's the complex of earthworks on the right next to the arable field in this photograph, that the North Manor was the, that one that, that was the manor owned by the Percy family, uh, while the, the South Manor was represented by this uh, rectangle on the left side of the uh, photograph here, was the manor of the Chamberlains. Now again Paul Everson and Dave Stocker came along and challenged this and said that there was no evidence that the Chamberlains would ever have had any sort of manorial residence within the village. Uh, and they suggested that both these manors had belonged to the Percy family at different part times. The South Manor on the left lasting for perhaps only 75 years or so before the um, Percy's acquired outright dominion over the village and moved to an out of town manor, bigger, grander and uh, more remote from the, the uh, urban scum. Uh, I didn't mean that, scum as in uh, dirt and noise rather than people, sorry, just to clarify. Um, so we have in a sense perhaps a, a rather similar situation at Thornton Le Street where the candidate for a manor house that we do have appears to be relatively late and relatively far from the centre of the village. So do we actually have an earlier manor house somewhere close to the church? Uh, I think that's an interesting possibility and as I've said in previous talks I wonder whether the area to be looking at is actually on the south side of your church in Thornton Street where uh, there was relatively little artifactual noise when you were doing field walking and I wonder whether that's because in fact we weren't looking at open fields there where the practice of night soiling would have distributed uh, lots of artifacts but in fact we're looking at the inside of the uh, manorial curia or precinct. So uh, this is just to illustrate again the point about uh, detailed earthwork survey. Um, this was uh, surveyed at very large scale during the uh, course of the um, uh, Warren Research Project and those of you who remember 1976 as well as I do will remember that it was a very hot summer so uh, presumably the grass was or although perhaps quite long might have been uh, relatively brittle and they might have been able to see the earthworks a little better but it still wasn't the ideal time to be doing earthwork survey. Nevertheless John Hurst and Jean Le Paterel did a very creditable job of trying to make sense of those earthworks I think and I would never knock someone who's uh, really been ambitious about trying to make something of earthwork evidence in the way that they did. And this is the reconstruction, you've already seen it, but this is the reconstruction of the North Manor on the on the bottom edge of this photograph that um, they reached based on that on that uh, survey. Um, but the same is point is true that I made before that actually uh, if you look hard for stratigraphic relationships in these earthworks you can get a lot more out of them. So in a sense 
there's not a great deal to choose between in metrical terms between these two surveys but in terms of the interpretation what we see is perhaps the development of the manor from a relatively small uh, conventional early thing to something with a rather grand outer court perhaps leaving behind the original manor as a sort of fusty old wing and perhaps with a, a rather elaborate approach to it possibly through gardens or stables or, or both um, and eventually the transition of that rather smarter manner uh, to uh, back to peasant housing and um, barns and so on. So in terms of Thornton Le Street I think the phase that we should be looking at is this one here because uh, the buildings uh, known as the old manor which have been identified as a possible manor house for the, the village of Thornton Le Street do appear to be relatively late and they have associated with them these earthworks which we haven't yet examined in as much detail as we should do which might well represent things like gardens and perhaps paddocks for animals and so on not necessarily all domestic animals as well we could we could have a sort of menagerie type thing uh, at about the date that the manor house at Thornton Le Street uh, is uh, appears to have been built so again I think there's more that we could do around the manor house but thinking very hard about whether it's the only manor house or whether it actually is a precursor much closer to the church as well so that precursor at uh, Warham at least this is what was encountered rather unexpectedly at the end of an excavation season this is the undercroft of a stone uh, solar block and there was a uh, great uh, debate over where the hall range would have been and uh, I think we can now say with some confidence that the hall range would actually have been right at the front of the property in other words uh, so the the uh, the solar block or the, the undercroft of the solar block that we looked at is the is the thing with the three pillars down the middle in the top right there and I think we can say that the hall range would have ac actually been to the right of that running perpendicular to the solar along the front of the property. Now I said that the discovery of that uh, undercroft was a surprise at the end of an excavation season. Again looking at the earthwork remains it this uh, enclosure this plain card shaped enclosure stands out within the medieval village plan as being something very different and I think it could have been uh, identified albeit uh, provisionally as being a possible manorial enclosure uh, long before that actually happened as a result of the excavations and the last point I wanted to make really I'm sorry I keep glancing at my watch so that I don't run over the um, last point I wanted to make is about the importance of the church because the church at Thornton Le Street just as at Warham is the last standing medieval building there um, although in fact the one at Warham Percy is now in considerably worse condition than yours but uh, its location within the plan of the village was regarded for a very long time as being the greatest mystery mystery of all at Warren Percy. Why was it down low, uh, not on the highest ground? Why was it not next to the manor? These are the familiar patterns that uh, we're used to. And again, Dave Stocker and uh, Paul Everson did, I think, a tremendous job of reinterpreting the fabric of this church in terms not of uh, of um, the increasing and diminishing size of the population but in terms of the lords of the manor and their desire to demonstrate their power through architecture um, so I would say looking going back and looking at your church again in greater detail is another thing that could be really usefully done and um, although geophysical survey uh, in the graveyard is a clearly a contentious issue. 
um, it would be something which theoretically at least ought to reveal whether there have been other phases of the church that are no longer detectable on the surface. So at Warham, just to, just to wrap up that story, um, my survey there identified the fact that the church had actually stood on uh, what had been, prior to the imposition of the, the east row of the village, what had been apparently the village green. And it was that that led Paul Everson and Dave Stocker to suggest that what we had in the founder burials there were free men. Uh, because they are the, the people who are recorded as a significant uh, pro pro proportion of the population at Warham. And Paul Everson and Dave Stocker suggested that actually it was these three important freemen uh, who were all of Scandinavian origin, as you can tell from their names, who were responsible for founding the church. And they suggested that actually the church was relatively close to the area where those soakmen, those, those freemen, free peasants, lived. I'm just going to skip on ahead a little in order to finish on time. Um, both at Warham and at Thornton Street, to me, to my mind, the biggest question mark that you still have to address is the issue of what was going on in the early medieval, early medieval period. In other words, pre-Norman conquest, I think that you could uh, expend a lot of time and energy uh, excavating the earthwork remains and perhaps around the church looking at the later medieval stuff and really be just dotting the I's and crossing the T's of what is known about medieval life uh, in general throughout this part of the country. But the early medieval period still remains a complete unknown, really. And it was the geophysical survey at Warren Percy that tended to suggest that actually uh, there were early medieval remains, possibly in the Middle Saxon period, which uh, shed light on the origins of the village. Again, two competing theories over exactly what that is, and those questions remain to be answered through excavation at Warren Percy just as they do at Thorntonley Street. But I would say that would be the area where I would concentrate on um, researching the origins of your own village. I just wanted to return to that because I think visualisations like this one, even though it's perhaps now uh, slightly out of date in some respects about what we know about the form of the North Manor and some of the peasant houses remain uh, outstandingly useful I think in terms of uh, conveying the appearance of medieval life and this is uh, one that was done for the guidebook that I, I produced um, in some respects it's much better but it still has flaws as well so I think, but I think that the process of doing these visualizations is actually really useful for forcing you to think about how you interpret different things. So that might be another uh, direction for your, your efforts in, in the coming uh, months and years. Lastly, a rather sobering point that uh, although the mission of the of the Warren Research Project was very much to try and understand what medieval peasant life was like for, for the bulk of the population. I don't think it really ever achieved that uh, quite as it has hoped. And in the end, reconstruction drawings like this one uh, rely very heavily on documentary evidence. And that gives us perhaps the best flavor of what medieval life was like for peasants uh, even after uh, nearly 40 years of excavation and research. So you are very much at the beginning of a journey and there are diverse uh, routes you could take to uh, explore its past. Uh, and I suspect actually 
that Warren Percy does not give you anything in some in some respects that you couldn't work out for yourselves. Uh, I think we tend to um, absorb the information from excavations, long running projects like Warren Percy without really being conscious of it. And probably you are now in a much better, we are all now in a much better position without realizing it because of projects like Warren Percy. The, the things that you would probably assume as standard practice were innovations for the Warren Research Project. But now uh, your horizons are actually rather different. So on that point, uh, I've done my three quarters of an hour as instructed and I hand back to Pam and say thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Um, how, how, how representative do you think the findings at Warren Percy are? Well, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think there it's a, a mixed bag because actually in terms of uh, the survival of the earthworks, the quantity and quality of the artifacts that were recovered, the volumes of, of uh, faunal remains and human bones and so on. Actually, Warren Percy does remain exceptional. So Warren, Warren was singled out because it was, uh, partly because it was a beautiful place to go and work, I think, partly because the quality of the earthwork remains gave them a sort of way in to understanding what they might expect uh, to excavate. But with hindsight, actually, Warham isn't that typical. Uh, the quality of the remains that you have at Thornton Street and um, both on the surface and below ground in terms of the houses you, or the, the suggestions of the house that you, that you discovered, um, which were not clear cut by any means, I think you would admit. You, you had a, a yard at the back and a um, yard at the front, but really no clear signs of a floor level or, or of structural elements around the edge. That's much more typical actually of medieval peasant buildings than anything at Warham. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. There are things that are quite representative and things that are really exceptional even now. So. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but actually Warren Percy was not necessarily the most representative site to pick in the first place. Thornton Street, on the other hand, might well be. Are most of the um, remains like Thornton Street, so um, very ephemeral, no great buildings in stone? No, exa exactly that. So the, the church is the only medieval building that survives at, at uh, both uh, sites. Actually, the remains at Warren Percy, if you go in, in winter, if you go now when the grass is short, are relatively clear in many places. Deciphering them is not, not always easy. You need, uh, you know, very often you need expert guidance to do that. But the, the remains themselves are pretty clear cut. By contrast, at Thornton Street, they are really ephemeral. I mean, uh, that's the reason why Jim got in touch with me in the first place, because because actually I spend my most of my life looking at really ephemeral humps and bumps. Um, whereas, I think had it been a site like Warren Percy, Jim wouldn't have had any doubts in in where to put his trench. Uh, but because the remains at Thornton Street are so feeble on the surface, um, there was considerable scope for getting it really wrong. So yeah, go and visit Thornton, uh, go and visit Warren Percy if you want to see clear medieval surface remains. Better still, go and visit Central York if you want to see what medieval houses look like. Yes, there's a, there's a comment from Kay saying there's an, in, it's interesting that um, there were two, two, two manors at various sites. Survey work at Eryholm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, about 16 miles from Thornton the Street, has suggested an early manor near the church and village houses and a later one some distance away from the Tofts and Crofts. And that w was quite common, wasn't it? Well, um, yes, uh, the, the trend to move out of town into uh, sort of 
green and rural suburbs of these villages, I think is 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 fairly um, well known. But actually, it's more it's it's partly an assumption rather than a, it's not not always been clearly demonstrated. But yes, I mean that that sounds like a really useful parallel. I didn't know about that, um, but I think it does seem to offer a, a certainly a sort of hypothesis that you could test at Thornton Le Street. The difficulty is that because the um, the documentary record is so skimpy at Thornton Le Street, it's going to be very difficult to tell whether you should expect to find an early manor because we don't have the records of uh, manorial land holdings which would would uh, tell us whether we, you know, one would be likely or not. So it may be that the the what, what you call the old manor at Thornton Street is built uh, from fresh out in the outskirts of the village, there not having been a manor house on the on, within the village at all before that. Mm. Uh, but I think the, the the hypothesis is a valid one, and it's one that you could uh, explore in various different ways. What would what would the reasoning be? Do you think for for moving the manor house? Because it, it must have been um, prestigious to be near the church to start with. Um, what do you think changed? Yes, I think I think possibly what changes is, is that they are um, they are looking for, for something more elaborate. So that is a uh, what we see a, a, the South Manor, the the early manor, appears to be a straightforward hall range and solar block, and it's quite a conventional sort of old-fashioned building. And I think actually when they move to the northern site. They're doing something a bit more elaborate, a bit more up to date, and they've got the space to do that. They've got, you know, room. For, we know actually from the documents that there's a, a small deer park there, um, uh, adjoining the the manorial precinct, and I've suggested that that's actually in the area where the the arable fields are now. That's the kind of thing that you couldn't really have achieved uh, uh, in the in the sort of relatively confined setting of the centre of the village. Um, but the point about the link between the the church and the and the manor house, um, they seem to have achieved that still visually because the uh, the church and the uh, although it's set down low would have been intervisible with the manor house, so slightly longer walk perhaps, uh, slightly less convenient, um, but nevertheless the link between the two in terms of um, power. Is, uh, is explicit and that said I think actually for anyone living in the village you don't you don't need that sort of physical proximity of the manor house to the church to tell you who's in charge and who's who's important you you know pretty well all the time. I've got a question uh, what were the earliest finds at Warren Percy? Well the, the earliest finds are actually Neolithic so um, you're only a stone's throw from the late Neolithic or middle Neolithic burial mound at Duggleby Howe. Um, and, you know, it's clear that in the Neolithic and certainly in the Bronze Age, it's a, it's a quite intensively exploited landscape up there. So there are, there are stray finds from the Neolithic and from, um, I don't think, maybe there was some Mesolithic stuff, I can't remember offhand. Um, but there is certainly Bronze Age material there. The earliest actual features are, are Iron Age. There are some Middle Iron Age square barrows, like the ones which uh, you find throughout East Yorkshire. One of those actually in the churchyard, and that was in, in, at one point was positive, posited as a reason why the church might have been built, a sort of Christianization of a pagan monument, uh, which I think is a bit unlikely because square barrows are such uh, diminutive little monuments, but uh, in, by the late Iron Age there are a series of settled enclosures there, so effectively small farmsteads arranged in in a sort of ladder-like pattern. So that, those are the uh, the sort of major settlement remains are late Iron Age, first century BC. And do you think that um, settlement would have been more or less continuous until the middle? No, I think I, I think. That was very much the sort of 
theory that was in vogue when the Warren Research Project was in its uh, relatively early, early stages was to think of settlement there as being a sort of trajectory with a, you know, a, a beginning, a middle and an end, a sort of an arc of set, a rainbow of settlement from a, growing from nothing to a peak and then diminishing gradually again. But actually, I think looking back now, what we can see is that there were periods when the village might have been uh, gone out of existence altogether and come back in. And it's only sort of uh, happenstance in some ways that, that keeps the village in the same place. Uh, so no, I don't think you should see it as, as a continuum necessarily. I think it's a series of linked events uh, the links between them not always being entirely clear. Sometimes they're down to sort of major economic factors. Sometimes they're down to the idiosyncratic decisions of individual landlords. So, yeah, not a not a uh, continuous history at all. Right. There's a, a comment about the Erry home and the manor moving that the church was burnt down at the time of the Scottish raids right. might that have been the time that the manor was moved um at Warham was 12, no this no, might be uh, not not uh, not at Warham I don't think no but at, at um uh Erry Erry home uh, well, the Scottish Scottish raids obviously reached their reached their peak around the early fourteenth century. Mm. Um, that, I mean, it's it's a problem before that, obviously as well. It might it might be the problem. Yes, um, that could be a reason that uh, you have a an opportunity for a fresh start, if you like. As an archaeologist, I'm always rather sceptical of trying to hang. Um, too much on individual documented events particularly when we have such a sort of threadbare documentary record um you know i feel like it's kind of historical supermarket shopping where you kind of uh, oh that, that that date suits me that event suits me i'll put that in the basket and, and keep that um actually in a sense i think you have to let the excavated evidence speak for itself. I'm not saying it's definitely not related to the historical events. Far from it. I mean, <clears throat> we must use the historical evidence as well. But I think it, it's it's perhaps too easy sometimes to say, "Oh, look, we've got this in the documentary record. Let's let's attribute everything to what we know through the documents." Actually, it's good to let the the archaeological evidence stand on its own two feet a bit. Right. And one last question. Do you think we should be looking at architectural analysis as a way forward? Yes, I think you should. Um, because, not least because uh, there may be, I, don't, I think it's unlikely having walked quickly through the middle of Thornton Le Street that you've got any surviving medieval buildings hidden away within those, uh, within the buildings of the village, but you might have individual elements, timbers and so on, and you might have things like cellars. I just don't know. That would be something that you as a community group would have a much better access to than I would. Um, so yes, uh, I think I do in short, think it's very a very worthwhile thing to do. Incidentally, you've just reminded me, um, I've, uh, I was also inspired by producing the film that we did of, of the walk around Thornton Le Street uh, last year uh, to do a bit of filming of my own for the undergraduates at York University, who I would normally be teaching face to face. So uh, if you want to go and look at uh, an exploration of a landscape uh, in my neck of the woods, if you go onto YouTube and search for Alastair Oswald, not Al Oswald, but Alastair, Al Oswald will take you to some of my older films, but Alastair Oswald will take you to my new YouTube channel. And there's a couple of films there which you might be interested to watch. Good. Thank you very much and uh, I'll thank you for answering all those questions and I'll hand back to Bill. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, brilliant. Brilliant, Al. You've come up trumps again for us and uh, you've certainly given us an awful lot of food for thought so what we should be doing in the village. Um, we're going to be knocking on your door again soon without a doubt. Uh, so just wait for the knock. <laughs> um,
Well, I do hope everybody enjoyed tonight's presentation. And once again, we will welcome your feedback. It's because of that that we can sort of focus and tweak things just a little bit and try and give you what you want. Uh, fortunately, not too many technical issues tonight. Everything's gone quite well. So that's really, really good as well. Uh, further thanks, we've got to thank the Lottery Heritage Fund because without them, we would not be able to present these webinars. I'm going to promote our book again. I do this every time. Uh, Thornley Street, the archaeology and history in its landscape. Um, it will probably give you an insight into some of the things that Al's been talking about. Um, you can, details are on our website or you could phone myself on 01845527717. Uh, the book's £5 plus £1.30 or so. Uh, most packing and also we still have some copies of um, uh, Chris Gerard's book about the soldiers taken at the Battle of Dunbar. Uh, the book's called Lost Lives New Voices. Bit of a heavier book, it's £15 plus postage and packing which is again I think £3.50 or £3.20 something like that. So get in touch please if you want either of those books, particularly our book because it goes into our funds and helps us finance future uh, events. Okay, moving on, our next webinar is on Thursday the 25th of March when we have Jim Brightman, uh, Solstice Heritage, and Jim's going to be talking about Finn Cop Hill Fort, an Iron Age massacre. So until then, uh, please all of you keep, in, keep safe and well, and if you get a chance to get your job, go and get it. Uh, so until then, I'll say good night. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.